Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Jesus Christ, our Lord, on this blessed Sunday, make us worthy to praise your resurrection with pure hearts and with clear consciences, with all the children of your holy church, we glorify and thank you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the good and merciful Lord, who in his compassion came down to us and became flesh. He chose to taste death to save us, and he descended to the realm of the dead. By his resurrection he gave joy to his disciples and gave light to the nations with the light of his salvation. To the good one be glory and honor on this blessed Sunday and all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. O Word of God, who can adequately praise you for the depth of your compassion, and what voice can bless you, for you are above all praise. Neither mind nor tongue can describe the wonders you accomplished on Sunday, the day of your resurrection from the dead. And so with the psalmist David we cry out, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us be rejoice in it and be glad. Now, O Christ, our God, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense which we offer you to forgive our sins, give peace of mind to those in distress, and comfort to those who are anxious. Bring back those who are far and watch over those who are near. Guide the shepherds and sanctify the priests and purify the deacons. Pardon all sinners and guard the righteous. Protect orphans and help widows, drive away all conflicts and put an end to all dissension. Remember the faithful departed and grant them rest in your heavenly kingdom, that with them we may celebrate that eternal feast. We raise glory to you, to your blessed Father, and to your living Holy Spirit forever.
O Lord, accept the sweet fragrance of our incense and make us worthy to announce your resurrection with the angels and to proclaim it with your women disciples and to rejoice in it with your pure apostles. We raise glory to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit forever. Shout with joy from the mountains, Sunday is a feast so great. Offer praise to the Lord God, and with angels celebrate. Reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. Brothers and sisters, hence, now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has freed you from the law of sin and death. <clears throat> For what the law, weakened by the flesh, was powerless to do, this God has done. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for the sake of sin, he condemns sin in the flesh so that the righteous decree of the law might be fulfilled in us, who live not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh are concerned with the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit with the things of the Spirit. The concern of the flesh is death, but the concern of the Spirit is life and peace. For the concern of the flesh is hostility towards God. It does not submit to the law of God, nor can it. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. On the contrary, you are in the Spirit. If only the Spirit of God dwells in you. Whoever does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, 
Although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is alive because of righteousness. If the spirit of one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. Praise be to God always. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in it and be glad. Glory and honor of the most of the Trinity. We burn this in the sense. Give you a reason. <clears throat> Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew, who proclaimed life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. Remain silent, listeners, for the Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you. Listen to give glory and thanks to the Word of the Living God. The Apostle Matthew writes, but the Pharisees went out and they took counsel among themselves against Jesus in order to put him to death. When Jesus realized this, he withdrew from that place and many people followed him and he cured them all, but he warned them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what had been spoken through Isaiah the prophet Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom I delight. I shall place my spirit upon him, and he shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not contend, nor shall he cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he shall not break, a smoldering wick he shall not quench until he brings forth justice unto victory and in his name the nations shall hope. This is the truth, peace be with you. Jesus, knowing this, went away from there, and many followed him, and he healed them all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. When we're at camp, and the fire from earlier in the evening has died down, and now it's time for s'mores, so we need a big fire going here. Uh, but all we have are ashes from this afternoon's hot dogs. We try to push it all back together. There's a few embers still kind of burning there. 
What we don't do is come in with the big logs we want for tonight's campfire songs and just drop them on top of those ashes because obviously it will snuff them all out. So we push them all to bed, bed it up, embank it, put some tinder on it, try to kindle it a little more, and then once it gets going, then we start putting our larger logs on to get a big fire so that we have light for our campfire tonight. That's today's gospel. Now in chapter 12 of St. Matthew, he's quoting from the prophet Isaiah chapter 42 that what the Messiah is doing is coming into this world in order to take what little light there is left. That's what it says by meaning that he will not quench, he will not suffocate the smoldering wick. The little light that is there, he will gently try to get back up into the fire. But it says regards to the nations, the non-Israelite people, the Gentiles, so that he will be a light and a hope to them. So what is St. Matthew quoting? He's quoting chapter 42 of the prophecy of Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah, the book is very long. It's like 61 chapters. And this is chapter 42. Throughout these prophecies, and most of Isaiah is poetry. It's Hebrew poetry. But throughout the poetry, you have five sections which are specific, what they call songs. There's a specific theme which in different parts of this long, long book that we refer to as being the songs of the servant of Yahweh, Ebed Yahweh, the songs of the slave of God is what they mean. And at the time of our Lord and previous to our Lord, it was always interpreted that these are referring to the Messiah. And so what St. John, what St. Matthew is doing today in this gospel is he's quoting from the first of these songs, chapter 42. It's the first nine lines of chapter 42. And it clearly states that the Messiah is coming. This is my beloved. This is the one whom I have placed my delight. And when he comes, he will bring light to the nations and his kingdom will be established as of justice, as truth becomes victorious. And so it's a very simple idea. But for all the Jews that St. Paul, that St. Matthew is writing his gospel for, they would all recognize this immediately, that he's applying these messianic prophecies to our Lord. Now our, our gospel today uh, starts abruptly because it just says, well, he left from there. But of course, the very first verse in that abruptness is talking about that the Pharisees come together to take counsel on how to kill him. They want him dead. This is chapter 12. So the Gospel of St. Matthew has 28 chapters. So this is about halfway through. And so you're beginning, St. Matthew's beginning to show the unraveling between the rabbi of Galilee and the authorities of Israel in Jerusalem. They don't like what he has to teach. And the, what sparks this is the episode just before, and as always, I, ask, you know, I mentioned to you, it's always good to read these chapters in their context. And of course, if you go back to it, what you'll see is that our Lord has been at the synagogue on a Saturday, like usual, every Saturday. But he notices in the group of people sitting here that there's a man who has a paralyzed arm. He has a crippled up hand. And so our Lord has them come forward. And he asks them whether or not it's allowed to heal someone on the Sabbath. Now the reason why this makes an issue for the Jews, of course, is because on the Sabbath, you have to be totally focused to God. We've talked about how far this can go um, with the Shabbat Goy and everything in Brooklyn. But one of the things that was interpreted by the teachers was is that you can't practice medicine on the Sabbath unless someone's life is in danger. So the man in the synagogue clearly is not dying. He's crippled, but he's not dying. And our Lord heals him and gives him a parable and says, you know, basically the teaching is, if you would save one of your animals on the Sabbath, and that's allowed, from out of a well, your lamb falls into a creek or something, of course you do all the things you use to get them out. And therefore, to do good to others, the acts of charity, the acts of compassion are certainly allowable, and he heals this man. 
This is the confrontation that takes place that makes them finally have the last straw that they want him dead. Now what our Lord does is what you notice in the prophecy of Isaiah is he will not shout out in the streets. He will not contend on the street corners. The Messiah will not fight. And so when their decision is to kill him, we're told in the gospel, he leaves that place, goes away, and the crowds follow him, and he heals everyone. So this is referring to a physical healing, but also more importantly for St. Matthew, it's referring to the healing of the spirit. Mind and body, spirit and body, body, soul, spirit. The healing, the salvatio, the shlomo, the healing that comes from the gospel is meant for the whole integral person. So yes, our Lord is healing people physically, but there's always meant to be a lesson of the mind to learn and to move forward towards the light. This is the banking around the embers which are still kind of smoldering, they're not totally out. And so our Lord heals them physically because it's a way to draw them towards understanding properly of God. And hence the healing of the man's hand in the synagogue is not primarily about the man's crippled hand. It's about learning about what God desires in his worship on the Sabbath. And so what he's doing here when the people are being healed is drawing them towards the light that is meant to be there. And that's why St. Matthew says that this is all done in order to fulfill what Isaiah had said, and then of course this long quotation. But the context goes on. <clears throat> Because in this crowd that's followed our Lord, someone brings up this man who is blind and mute and also possessed. So he has three problems going on here. His life is not very good. And our Lord heals him, frees him of his possession, heals him of his blindness and gives him the ability to speak. And the Pharisees who have still been around here in this crowd they're like, well, this is just black magic. He's doing sorcery. That's how he does these things. They will not accept that maybe this is coming from God. Now, we run across this all the time, this resistance when God's grace works in people's lives. We've probably seen it in our families. They'll do anything, scream, swear, throw things, anything then come closer to the fact that maybe Jesus is truly having truth to proclaim. So they see this man being healed, freed from a possession, being given his sight and the ability now to speak the praises of God. And they don't, they, their mind, because it's corrupt, do not follow what they see with their eyes. So he's practicing magic, that's how this is taking place. And then our Lord gives the famous parable about a kingdom divided, by, divided in its, against itself. And then at the end of all of this, there's a famous line where he says, he who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather in with me scatters. All right? This was not first quoted by President Bush after 9-11. He's quoting the gospel. Of course, in a totally unacceptable context, because our Lord, this is the Lord God who says, he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. This is God speaking. And that's why for a president to make that statement as if being in, a, in union with the United States was somehow equal to being in union with the Messiah, it's a blasphemous context to have quoted. Of course, it made all the liberals scream because it's like, you can't do this. And then, of course, we went to war that we're still at. But the context of the quotation is here when he finally has enough of the Pharisees, this constant opposition, and he simply makes the statement. He's not fighting with them. This isn't an argument. He's just saying, look, light has entered into the world. You come to the light, the one who is with, if you're not with me, then you're in opposition to the light. If you're not gathering into God, then by definition you are scattering. And so that's your context of this gospel today, which at first can look mysterious. 
It gives us a better understanding of the Messiah, but it also gives us, as our last application, of that face of Christ that we've been talking about over these weeks. That you are the face of Christ in the streets, in the grocery stores, at work, at school, wherever. You are an extension of that reality of the light which heals the man that is possessed and the man who is blind and mute. The ability to see, the ability to speak, and the clarity of mind, the clarification of the way we think which is so essential because if our thinking is screwed up, our actions will necessarily be screwed up. And if our actions and our minds are screwed up, then our eternity will be screwed up. The healing that comes is the clarification of the mind. Now when we use the word in English, clarification, it usually means making something a little more straightforward and understandable. But clarification in, from the Latin origin of the word literally, claudus means brilliant, shining. That's what the word, the woman's name, Claire, means. She's brilliant, she's bright, she's lovely. So clarification means the action of making our minds lucid to think. That's why over these last weeks and probably over the next weeks, we're gonna be going through different ideas to disentangle the things that surround us concretely in the world today that's being imposed, the extension of abortion in Maine, the now and the implementation of assisted suicide. How does the Catholic look at these things? How do we judge? And so we're trying to disentangle for clarification within the bulletins over these weeks. And so, as I say, the last point of us to consider in this gospel is what is the face of Christ then? It's not for us to be screaming at each other in the streets. That makes no sense. It's not the path of the Messiah. It's not our path. Clarity of thought, discussion, and never a compromise in doctrine. That's clear. He who is not with me is against me. That clarification of doctrine that comes from the Messiah can never be compromised. And I bring this up because in the modern world, in kind of our sentimentalistic version of Christianity, the idea of showing compassion in practice means condoning, right? So you're showing mercy to someone means you condone whatever, their relationship or whatever sinful activity they're doing. But that's not mercy. That's condoning what they do. And St. Paul says in his letter to the Romans, not only do those who sin will be found guilty, but those who also excuse the sin of others will have the same guilt. So that's clearly not compassion or mercy. The compassion or the mercy is mean we know that by the gospel we have a healing balm. We have something that brings healing, not because it's ours. We're the ones who are already bringing it, we are already receiving this healing. And our desire is that others come to this clarification of mind and healing also. That's not something you need to scream at and fight over in the streets. You don't compromise, but in the discussions with others, in that, lack of comp in that lack of no compromise, is precisely to try to bring the gospel to their understanding. But the second point in it is, he will not smother the smoldering wick. He will not break the bruised reed. So we always accept people where they are now. I'm not going to condone the relationship that they're in, but I will certainly talk to them and lead them. I don't deal with their relationship first because they're not able to hear that. We begin by leading them in the kind of banking and small things that you lead them up. And I can guarantee you, your cousins, your sisters, your brothers, your parents, your colleagues, your fellow students, they will eventually understand by that little embankment, they start putting two and two together, as we say. And they begin to understand, and by the clarification of mind, there is a resolution on the moral issues of people's lives. And on that, so as the last point is just that we have, it's not something that we scream about, but it is something that we are convicted about, something that we are desirous to share with others. But in application to the people around us, it's that embankment. To get that little tiny smoldering wick to start burning again. 
And then when it starts to burn, now we can start bringing out, they're moving forward. Now we can bring out the logs for the s'mores. Now we can start stacking wood onto this to actually enkindle fire. And then of course that illuminosity of that kindled fire now will share with others. And this is the way the gospel has always spread, person to person. And so as a result, for us, we can admire what the Messiah does in this act of compassion and clarity of thought, which is why the whole quotation of Isaiah, if you look at it again, finishes by saying that this is the way things will be until, that's the word until, this is the way things will be until justice and holiness becomes victorious. And in him, all the nations of the earth shall find hope because there has been gentleness in their, own, in their own occasion, but he has brought them to the full victory of holiness, and that is the foundation of hope, is that healing is possible. When we are convinced of that in our own personal lives, then we will be desirous to pass that communication and that healing to others. And so we finish with that last quotation from Isaiah, that the bruised reed he shall not break, and the smoldering wick he shall not extinguish till he establish God's truth victorious. You are the face of Christ. You leave with the blessings of the holy altar that we say each time under the blessed Trinity's confirmation in grace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it is meant that you take that holiness from the divine mysteries out of healing and of light and of compassion, but never compromise so that God's justice and holiness reign victorious in the kingdom of this world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you. Out of their love for you and for your holy name, shower your spiritual blessings upon them and in place of your their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, Saint Mary, and Saint Jude, and Saint Charbel. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers, and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the repose of Paul of Verdier. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. Amen. Continue with the anaphora of St. Mark on page 835. 835. 
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord God, Almighty Father, you are true in holy love. May we be bound by your divine love and find joy in it all the days of our lives. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with the holy kiss that through Jesus Christ our Lord we may be your radiant and blameless flock. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to your holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let each one of us give a greeting of peace to his neighbor, before you and ask that you grant us in your mercy the riches of your grace and kindness. May your compassion and assistance sustain us all the days of our lives through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, for now and forever. Holy God and Father, you sent your only Son to save us, for we are weak and poor. When we had gone astray, he brought us back to your spiritual fold by his royal blood. Through your grace and the favor of your only Son, we implore you to accept this bloodless sacrifice from our sinful hands, and through it to forgive our sins. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father, and the grace of the only begotten Son, and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your Spirit, let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. It is right and just. Truly glory, thanks, and praise are, and honor are yours, O God the Father, maker of all creation. With your only begotten Son and your living Holy Spirit, the angels, archangels, and all the heavenly hosts bless and praise you. They cry out and they proclaim. from you by transgressing your law. You sent your only Son into the world for our salvation. 
By his saving passion, he restored us to our original inheritance, and he gave us life by his divine blood. Whenever you observe these commandments, you proclaim my death and resurrection until I come again. We remember your death, O Lord. We profess your resurrection. We await your second coming. We implore your mercy and compassion. We ask for the forgiveness of sins. May your mercy rest upon us. Lord Jesus Christ, we remember your plan of salvation for us, your conception, birth, and baptism, your saving passion, and your life-giving death, your burial, your glorious resurrection, and ascension into heaven, your sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and your royal second coming when you shall judge all people and reward them according to their deeds. Now we ask you, at that fearful hour, have compassion on us and have mercy on us in your kindness and forgive our sins in your mercy. For this your church implores you and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father, have mercy on us. O Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. Since he may make this bread the body of Christ our God. Amen. And make the mixture in this chalice the blood of Christ our God. Amen. May 
pray these holy mysteries be for the forgiveness of sins, the pardon of faults, the honor of building and strengthening of your holy church, and the protection of her children from all sin. And may these holy mysteries allow us to stand with confidence before your awesome throne, that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. O Lord, exalt your holy church established throughout the world. Protect her shepherds of the true faith in peace and security all the days of their lives, especially Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bashara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops, pious priests, pure deacons, and all who serve your holy altar. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, all those who call upon your holy name. Bless those who are near and bring back those who are far. Visit the sick and strengthen the weak. Release captives and assist the oppressed. Bring back those who have strayed that they may live in your fear and reward those who have brought offerings to your holy church. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, our civil leaders and all the children of your holy church. Grant them security and peace and keep domestic and foreign conflicts far from them so that they may live in tranquility. Protect them by the sign of your living and victorious cross. Rescue the persecuted and the displaced of your flock and be a refuge for the strangers, a companion to travelers. Grant your eternal reward to monks and those who live solitary lives and to hermits who live on mountaintops and in the caves of the earth. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, upon this altar and upon your heavenly altar, the holy and ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of God, the prophets, apostles, martyrs, confessors, and evangelists, John the Baptist, the forerunner, Stephen, the archdeacon and first martyr, St. Joseph, St. Jude, St. Tecla, and all the saints. May we join in their ranks and share in their joyful rest. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the faithful teachers who have gone to their rest in the true faith, especially Peter and Paul, Mark, Clement, Ignatius, Dionysus, Julius, and all those who endured suffering and persecution for the strengthening of your holy church. Remember also those who serve your holy altar and forgive their sins, that they may reach your joyful dwellings. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, of all those who have left this world and have gone to you. Lead them to your joyful dwellings and blot out all their sins. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant rest, O God, to the departed, and forgive the sins we have committed, with or without full knowledge. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, is now, and shall be forever. Amen.
pleasing oblation, who offered yourself for us. You are the forgiving sacrifice, who offered yourself to your Father. You are the high priest, who offered yourself as the Lamb. Through your mercy, may our prayer rise like incense, which we offer to your Father through you. To you be glory forever. O God the Father, you are merciful and compassionate. You have sanctified this divine service and have perfected it in your good pleasure by the grace of your only Son and by the descent of your Holy Spirit. Sanctify us now, that we may be renewed as your spiritual children, so that with pure hearts and enlightened souls we may call upon you, O glorious Father and lover of all people, praying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Deliver us, O Lord, from every temptation of soul and body, and crush our enemy, the evil one. Grant us your mercy through Christ Jesus, our Lord, for you are blessed and glorified with him, and with your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of it, and receive the blessing of the Lord. O Lord, look upon us, your inheritance, who bow before you, and guide our steps on your right path. Make us worthy to share in this sacrifice, and may it sanctify the souls and bodies of those who receive it, through Christ Jesus our Lord. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One, one Holy Father, Father one Holy Son, Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth, to him be glory forever. Make, Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy God, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins, and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory
God the Father, how can we who are unworthy thank you for your grace? For you have given us this divine gift and have made us worthy to share in the body and blood of your only begotten Son who saved us. Through him and with him glory and honor are due to you and to your Holy Spirit now and forever. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Jesus Christ, our Lord and God, you are worshipped and you are holy. Bless and forgive the priests who are the stewards of your people and of your holy church. Forgive the servers of your divine mysteries and all the faithful who have shared in this sacrifice. Care for orphans, help widows, assist the poor and the distressed. Satisfy the hungry and protect all who call upon your holy name in every place. 
May your name be glorified with that of your Father and of your Holy Spirit, who is good, life-giving, and consubstantial with you, now and forever. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings that you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.